Well, we're ready for our grand finale speaker, who is both an Army captain and a successful technology entrepreneur and business leader in Southern California before he came to Congress. Daryl Issa earned a business degree on an ROTC scholarship and then became an Army officer. He then founded and built Directed Electronics, which became the nation's largest manufacturer of vehicle anti-theft devices, including the Viper system. He was named Entrepreneur of the Year by Inc. Magazine and by Ernst & Young. He also served as chairman of the Consumer Electronics Association. ISA currently serves as chairman of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee in the House of Representatives. I think you had a markup this afternoon. <laughs> and uh, where he's championed for more efficient government and greater transparency across the federal bureaucracy. Lucky for us, Daryl Issa is also a member of the Judiciary Committee. As the holder of 37 patents, Issa has been vigilant about protecting intellectual property rights of artists and other entrepreneurs at the forefront of American innovation and creativity in the entertainment and technology industries. Late last year, uh, Chairman Issa rode to the rescue with an incredibly timely and sophisticated reality check on harmful and hasty online copyright legislation that nearly got approved by the Judiciary Committee. Daryl Issa's forceful and informed leadership is much appreciated by CCIA, CCIA's member companies, our CEO Ed Black, and all of us in the internet-based industry. Welcome, Mr. Issa. Sorry, sorry to give you the bump, and worse than that, finding out I'm closing the place. <laughs> well, I, I would suggest that uh, you stay and, and plot against SOPA Revisited, which is undoubtedly in somebody's planning as we speak. Uh, it is interesting. I know you opened up this morning with uh, Congressman Chaffetz of Utah, and then he came running to the markup we've been in most of the time since, uh, uh, most of it financial in nature, and, and most of it partisan. Uh, but together, we were together here last night uh, with Digital Patriots, just one floor down, uh, celebrating what, to a certain extent, we're all celebrating here, which is an opportunity to keep the web open, to keep internet commerce and innovation at the forefront here in America. And uh, so for, for us, that's a bipartisan, nonpartisan view. The people that, that fought to uh, promote open and to uh, uh, stop SOPA and PIPA didn't have R's or D's uh, as their first uh, part. They had, what do you want to do? You want to take on Hollywood? Yes. Uh, last night we talked about the, uh, the famous case uh, uh, because uh, David Rubenstein was with us who had been one of the consuls when the Sony Betamax was decided by the Supreme Court and ultimately ruined the movie, the movie business, mo ruined the motion picture business, destroy, oh, I'm sorry, I, maybe I'm a little off, was going to ruin it until, in fact, the videotape revolutionized the opportunity to sell movies outside the movie uh, studios and give them a continuous market, which under DVDs continues today. And so it's rather ironic that these decades later, having left industry, uh, we were all together last night realizing that SOAP and PIPA were simply Sony Betamax revisited. They were really just an industry who says, I see only one thing to do, which is the status quo. I've got to find a way to protect, I'm sorry, it's Barack, I can't take it, can I? Uh, the, uh, I'll tell you, you know, it's, it's really good to have a name you don't have to describe. I, you know, if it was Sting or Prince or anybody, it would work. But, it, I think for all of us, what we have to do is we have to say, it's not the attack of the Luddites. They don't hate technology, they're just afraid of it. That in fact, decades ago, in the early 80s, they were afraid of the videotape recorder. They were afraid that it got in, into a business that they were comfortable with. They were comfortable with, they would, they would make movies, they would sell it to A movie theaters, then B movie theaters, and C movie theaters, and then they'd try to make a little money on broadcast television. And there was this newfangled thing, cable, that hadn't produced a lot of revenues but might have promise. We proved them wrong decades ago. They came back again with the same concept. My goodness, you know, we absolutely cannot uh, tolerate this. We have to have all kinds of, of things to protect the DVD. The fact is the DVD is dead. It doesn't know it yet, but the DVD is dead. Online direct delivery of video, audio of all sorts, in addition to obviously 
our, our everyday communication that more and more is, is online video, and it's not going through an AT&T video phone. It's going th th uh, through every appliance we have, and it's going point to point without having an exchange in the middle and without a carrier other than simply the common carrier of the Internet. We can't stop that, we shouldn't stop that, and if we try to stop it, the rest of the world will simply ignore us and move on and innovate around us, and, and we'll be buying all of our appliances and seeing all of our technology coming from other sources. I am a believer that none of that's going to happen, that in fact 7,000 plus websites made it very clear through shutting down, through blacking out, through all their various protests, that in, that the new generation is not only stronger, but it's the answer. Now, the Motion Picture Association, the Recording Artists Indi uh, Association, they get it. They get it that, in fact, a better solution to help them is underway and we will work with them. And that the same innovation that they fear is the same innovation that's not only going to protect, but to deliver their products in more and more exciting ways. And I don't, do you want me to take questions if I don't actually get a vote? Much better. I'm much better at answering questions, although they're not necessarily responsive, but I'm still better at answering questions. I believe that there are products that do not exist that will be created by the very source material that SOPA and PIPA thought they had to protect using basically the, uh, the Justice Department and the federal courts and an expansive government. I believe there are products that are going to be created the same as the recording artists today enjoy huge revenues from ringtones and they want to protect it. It wouldn't exist if it hadn't been first available through innovators who simply came up with an idea, did a little sampling, and then went and knocked on the door of the, of the holders and said, would you mind if I could do this and I don't want to pay a dollar a song? You've got to give me a discount because I'm only taking a few seconds of it, but I'm going to sell it and I'm going to earn you revenue you never would have made because they're not buying the song, they're only getting a ringtone. That kind of thinking is what we need to do. I know we're going to do it, and I know that Congress now has a wake-up call where they'll never again look at one side without saying, what does the other and all sides think? Last but not least, I know Mark Warner was over here, Senator Warner. He's the champion on the Data Act, which for all of us that want to open up government, make it more transparent, allow industries to be formed in, in essentially telling you or helping you find everything you want to know within your government, not just census reports, but far beyond that, including uh, where the next really hot Las Vegas GSA party will be held. <laughs> and with that, I'll take your questions. Okay, so that means my, my, I have to have much piffier answers. Yes, sir. No, I cannot tell you where the next conference is. We're working on it, though. <laughs> Um, as a, uh, a company with a, a substantial San Diego presence, we thank you for all the work that you do representing uh, people of California and trying to do the good work you are in government oversight. Um, there's a policy that, that CCIA was one of the vocal supporters of for many years. Uh, in fact, it had survived through about five, a half dozen more presidencies, uh, Democratic and Republican. Uh, it used to be called OMB Circular A76. And what that did, it dealt with the notion of competition between government and the private sector. Right. It came to symbolize this whole issue of government outsourcing and the fights with unions and all sorts of issues, which was never CCIA's interest. Well, CCIA's interest, uh, the association has always championed free, fair, and open competition but it had never uh, liked the idea of government using public funds to compete with the private sector. <laughs> and so the great thing about A76, even though it was only a presidential policy, it wasn't a law, was that it not only dealt with that issue of outsourcing, it dealt with this other issue of almost, you could call it insourcing, mm -hmm. that if there's a commercial private sector competitive activity, it shouldn't be absorbed to become a new function of government. Uh, in fact, the old A76 even had language that said uh, a commercial activity is not a governmental function. Government should not start or carry on any activity to provide commercial products or services. Uh, about 10 years ago, that uh, A76 was all rewritten. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you went and looked at the public file, you'd find CCIA comments saying, you're doing something that's not good, because what it did was so focus solely on outsourcing, mm -hmm. 
and eliminated all of these guidance protections that government shouldn't try to recreate private sector activities as a new function. Nobody's done anything about it to revisit it. There's a whole lot of agencies that think that they should use government funds to create software to do this, websites to do that, and so on, that duplicate private sector functions. It's something that needs to be looked at again. Government reform and oversight is exactly the place to do it. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I think when we, as we modernize the process, it's really a matter of enforcing the other part of the mandate, which is competitive bidding. Ultimately, the federal government, any government, but take the federal government, has no right to compete against you for non-government services. That's a given. We don't want the post office expanding into, you know, selling flowers and, and, and you know, and, and anything other than stamps, so to speak. But I think the important thing, and we saw this in San Diego, regular competitive bidding of things which are outsourced to be insourced, insourced to be outsourced, with a fair recognition that the incumbent entity, whether it's in-house or out-of-house, has a transition cost advantage. And then you make an analysis of what's in the best interest of the taxpayer for the lowest, lowest total cost. In San Diego, that caused us to outsource our entire out IT, lock, stock, and barrel. Our, we had to do a, an analysis of what it would be if our insourced assets would bid on it because our own people at the County of San Diego told us, look, we're just not going to be competitive. We can't produce a level of quality. And that's gone on with SAIC and CSC and others for now more than a decade. And I know that because I chaired the committee that, uh, that made the selections uh, as a private citizen. And I've been, I've been up here for 12 years. And it's, it's, it's now been contract renewed. And yet it was something that people, they said, well, you know, it's inherently governmental. No, it wasn't inherently governmental, and it was more expensive than being done poorly. I believe that, that competitive bidding and not allowing, if you will, an incumbent to have a free ride is important. And at any time, if, in fact, the federal workforce wants to say that they can produce a product for the federal workforce competitively, they should have an opportunity to do it. But if they lose then the winner should get the contract, so to speak. And that's the principle that I think government oversight can make clear. And most of it's already in statute. We simply have to make sure that it occurs. And uh, you know, the thing about executive orders of any sort is they seem to have all the force the president who wants it wants it and no force for the next president who doesn't. And Congress has a role to make sure there's a continuity because we shouldn't be adding to the federal workforce what is ultimately a private sector job. And I'll close with this, because I did, it wasn't piffy as I said I'd be. You know, our committee is looking at things like the TSA. And you, most people who were in this room were traveling in 2001 when there was no TSA. They were traveling in 2004 when there were 12,000 people of TSA, and you were the lines and you went through them, and the process was no fun, but it worked. There's now 67,000 people in the TSA, and I just don't feel five times better and safer or more convenient. So I know what happens when we simply say something's inherently governmental, when in fact telling you to take your water bottle out and to do these other things, the vast majority of those jobs can be done under the authority of the TSA, but not with contractors. And that's not particularly cyber and internet, but it's just an example of a, a bureaucracy. And I guarantee you there are more people doing IT for TSA than there should be people working for TSA. Thank you. Thank you.